Uh, this is part of our admonition from God, which is to raise our children in the love and admonition of the Lord. And this is part of making disciples of your kids. I, I once heard someone make a, the comparison of discipling your children is like all the meals that your mama made for you when you were a kid. You know, three meals a day, 365 days a year, 18 years of your life. That's over 19,000 meals. You might have remembered some of the, her favorites that you made, but I doubt that you remember what you had for lunch on June 4th and 3rd grade, right? We don't, you don't remember individuals, but that it's the daily nutrition that leads to maturity. So when you bring your children to a Sunday school, in Sunday school, it's the systematic teaching of God's words in age-appropriate ways that someone has sat down and figured out how does a three-year-old learn? How does a six-year-old learn? How does a nine-year-old learn? How do we teach the scope of Scripture over the course of, uh, of the lifetime of a child. And so when you bring your kids to Sunday school, that's what you're doing. Awana is the same way. In Awana, we challenge children to memorize Scripture and to think about life's questions through the lens of Scripture. And Vacation Bible School is another way that you are making disciples of your kids. For Thank you for your faithfulness of that. Uh, we also always have children of families that are not members of our church. You may be new to our community and you're looking for a church home. Uh, they're building houses everywhere in Benbrook. I don't know if you've seen that or not. Uh, 377 is packed all the time. Uh, so we're glad to have new residents to our community. And if you are been visiting our church and looking for a church home, I just want to personally invite you. I, I teach a class about every two, three months. It's called Discovering Church Membership. It, our next one is next Sunday morning. It's during the Sunday school hour. It's in the Fellowship Hall, which is the corner of our campus right across from the Brahms drive through But uh, I teach that class. It's just an hour to talk about what does it mean to be a member of a church? What does it mean to be a member of our church specific? And we'd love, love to have you come explore and learn more about our church. No obligation to join. Just learn more about our church. If you'd like to come to that, there's a QR code in your bulletin. Uh, scan that. Let us know you're coming. That way we can make sure we have enough materials. Uh, or just let me know after uh, church is over. Uh, we have a huge group of volunteers that make VBS work. You know, the reason that a lot of churches don't do VBS is just because they can't get enough volunteers. It takes a lot of volunteers. And I know our volunteers already stood, but I want to recognize just a special subgroup of volunteers. If you're one of our students, our youth, and you worked in VBS this year, would you stand up? I want you to see how many of our, our students. Thank you, guys. Y'all can be seated. Excellent job. Great attitude. Great service. Couldn't do it without you and appreciate that. So we've, we've spent the week, adults, students, children of BBS, we've spent the week looking at Romans chapter 2. And most of you have, have been uh, thinking about that either in crafts or in missions or Bible study or one particular aspect of that. And I'd like for us just to kind of put the, the, the exclamation point upon that as you will. I want us to look at uh, our theme verse was Romans 12 too, but we're going to look at the first two verses of Romans as well. And let's just kind of put all of these meditations that we've been thinking about this verse together uh, for one last amen to the Lord. So this great passage of Romans where Paul writes, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And just walking through that incredible passage of Scripture, Paul starts by saying, therefore. You probably heard the old joke, whenever you see therefore, you've got to stop and ask the question, what's it there for? Uh, he is looking back to everything that he's already written in the book of Romans. Romans begins, the wrath of God is revealed against all unrighteousness. Romans 3, for all have sinned and fall short of the gl glory of God. Romans 6, the wages of sin is death. Romans 3, there's nothing that we can do. We can't become righteous by works of the law. By works of the law, no man is made righteous. Romans 3, we are justified by his blood as a gift that we receive by faith. Uh, justification means the way that we are made right with God, the way God declares us not guilty. It's a, it's a gift that we receive. It's through His blood that's been shed on the cross, and we respond to that by faith, as you heard the kids sing, coming to that place in your life where you realize what Romans says about you is true, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and there's nothing that you can do about that. But believing that what Romans says is true, that, that God sent His Son, and it's through His death on the cross that we're made right with God, and responding to 
through that by faith, but, but it continues. It talks about in Romans 8 about how those of us who are in Christ, we have the Spirit of God. At the end of Romans 8, if God be for us, who can be against us? So at, at the result of all of that, and that's a huge change to go from the wrath of God is revealed against all unrighteousness to if God be for us, who can be against us? Uh, to go from that point to Romans. But as a result of all of that, Paul says, because of all of that, therefore, that's why he talks about presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice. But notice he says, by the mercies of God, or because of the mercies of God. Paul is not telling us that we should present our bodies as living sacrifices uh, begrudgingly or because we're trying to appease an angry God. He presents it as a worship response to the manifold mercies of God. Because of God's great, incredible mercies, because God has created each one of us. Our church has been memorizing, hopefully, Psalm 139 through the bulletin verses and how God has created each one of us individually. But Romans 6 set us free from the power of sin. Romans 5 demonstrates His love towards us by Christ dying on the cross, giving us the gift of life calling us to follow Him, being our Good Shepherd, as we talked about last Sunday, leading us to abundant and eternal life. Because of the manifold mercies of God, the response to that is to present ourselves as living sacrifices. You notice that he says at the end of verse 1, which is your spiritual worship. It's an interesting phrase. That's how the ESV translates it. The word translated spiritual is the word that we get the word logic from. That's why some of your translations talk about being reasonable or being rational or being true and proper. Uh, and that word worship can also be translated service. So what Paul is saying is a logical, rational response to the manifold mercies of God is that we would present ourselves as a living sacrifice because of the manifold mercies of God that we have received. So he talks about a living sacrifice. Please, uh, we need to remind ourselves this is not a sacrifice for our sins, right? We're not trying to present ourselves as a living sacrifice to make up for our sins or to, to get God to forgive us of our sins or anything. Christ is the once and for all sacrifice. It's through His offering that our sins are atoned for. So we're not living sacrifices for our sins, and we're not living sacrifices that are ceremonial. And by ceremonial, I mean this kind of outward religious activity that doesn't really have anything to do with our heart, kind of going through the motions, going to church, sitting in the pew, singing songs, listening to a sermon, whatever. It's not just outward religious activity, but it is our bodies. Present your bodies as living sacrifices. We are embodied souls. And our bodies carry out the expression of our hearts. Jesus talks about this. It's out of the overflow of our heart that the mouth speaks. And so our bodies are our entire selves. And so the calling here is to present our entire selves as a, a living sacrifice and how that is the logic and rational thing to do and as a response to the manifold mercies of God. I like the second verse because it helps define what a living sacrifice is. First of all, he says, do not be conformed to this world. That word world in Scripture sometimes talks about just all people. God so loved the world. Sometimes it talks about physical creation. God created the world. But sometimes it talks about the system of the world that is in opposition to God, opposition to His ways, to His truths, to His heartbeat, that there is this world in which we live in, when we talked about this with preteens, I had the pleasure of working with preteens, and Tuesday night I taught and, and talked about how uh, the culture that we live in has values. Culture that we live in has ways of behaving and ethics, what's right, what's wrong. Culture we live in has promises that this is what you should pursue to be happy. This is how you find happiness. Culture that we live in talks about truth and how you can find truth. And that culture is contrary to God, and this world is trying to mold us into its image. It's trying to conform us. So being a living sacrifice is resisting that. It's not allowing ourselves to be conformed into this world, but instead being transformed. That word transform is the word uh, that we get metamorphosis from. It's when you think of a caterpillar changing into a butterfly. It literally means to change forms. When we are transformed, we are metamorphosized when we come to Christ. So this begins in salvation. You know, salvation is not just mentally agreeing with some truth claims about Jesus. 
Salvation is being reconciled with God. Salvation is having our sin debt canceled. But salvation is becoming a new creation in Christ. This is how Jesus described it. It's being born again. It is a change of form. And that continues, not just at the moment of salvation, but it continues for the rest of our life. The big Bible word for that is sanctification. We receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit continues to transform us into the image of Christ. And so being a living sacrifice is not being conformed to this world, but instead being transformed. And isn't it interesting, he talks about by the renewal of our mind, the renewal of our mind. Mind. I was struck by two things this week as I was uh, meditating over this verse. The combination of be transformed, which is, talks about passive. We are being transformed by the work of the Spirit. And then the renewal of the mind, which is our active involvement in that. So Scripture says, work out your salvation because it's God who is at work in you. And so we're, we're doing both of those. We are uh, working to strive to put to death the deeds of the flesh by the Spirit that is at work within us. And so we are working to renew our mind, but it's really the Spirit of God that is at work in ourselves as well. And so it's our mind that needs to be removed. We need to think differently. As one commentator put it, it's not just thinking about Christian things, but it's thinking Christianly about all things. It's having a Christian worldview, a biblical worldview of looking at life and having our mind renewed so that instead of this world that is trying to conform us, that we are, our mind is being renewed into the ways of God's, the truth of God's, the, the peace of God, the person of God. And it says that do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of the mind that you might discern what is the will of God. Boy, isn't that a, a huge topic? As I was working through that this week and if you're a member of our church, you remember last year we spent, uh, I think, 25 weeks on Romans 8, one chapter. Uh, and I, I was thinking, well, we could spend 26 weeks on these two verses. This is a lot of truth in these two verses. We're not going to, but we could, right? But the will of God, uh, the, the will of God is, is a huge thing. But th we can think about the, the divine eternal will of God, which is God's desire for all people to be saved. It's His divine eternal plan that everything will be brought under the headship of Christ. So what does God want? He, well, he wants everything under the headship of Christ. Beyond that, we can think of the moral will of God, which is how does God want all humans to behave? What's his will for us? Do not steal, do not kill, do not commit adultery. He's revealed this is his will for all humans. But even beyond that, we can think of the individual will of God. There is this sense when you read Scripture that God has created us individually and intentionally and has a plan for our lives. Do you remember our memory verse for last vac vacation Bible school was Ephesians 2. We are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for, to do good works, which he prepared in advance for us to do. Colossians, Paul prays for the church that they would be filled with the knowledge of his will so that they could walk in a manner worthy of him, that, of, of knowing what God wants you to do with your life. And so here's Paul saying, what does it mean to, to present yourself as a living sacrifice is to not be conformed to this world, be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And when you do that, you'll understand God's will for your life and how he wants you to live out your life. And what you'll find out is that that will is good and pleasing and complete. The ESV uses the word perfect, but it, the, the word means to be mature, to be complete. And this is not describing what God thinks about his own will. It's not saying that God believes his will is good, God believes his will is pleasing, it's complete. Obviously, all those things are true. I think what Paul is trying to let us know here is that when we discern the will of God for our lives, what we're going to find out is it's good for us. It is pleasing to us. It is complete. It is mature. It is well thought out. In other words, this world is telling us this is how you pursue happiness. This is how you pursue the good life. And yet what we find out when we're not conformed to that world, but we're transformed and we pursue the will of God, while we find out this is what is good, this is what is pleasing, and this is what is perfect. This is what Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly because this is God's will for us. And then that last little element about this verse, he talks about testing. Not all tra English translations have the word testing in the English. The word discern, though, means to prove 
to approve and to test. It's kind of like product testing that companies do. Companies come up with a product and then they do the product test. And when they do that, what they're doing is demonstrating that their product works. See, it works. They've tested it. And what Paul is saying is, is that when we, uh, we can test, improve, and demonstrate that the will of God works as we put that works into action. So two truths out of that simple statement. We're not going to see the goodness of God's will until we begin to put that will into action. Until we begin to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Until we begin to follow Him, stepping out in faith. And that's when we begin to see that God's will is good and pleasing and perfect. But also just as a simple reminder, sometimes we're in seasons of life where it's hard to feel the good, the, the complete, and the perfect and pleasing because we're in a season of life of suffering or groaning or waiting. There are trials of life. And sometimes it's in the midst of those that we have to believe and hope that if we will continue to walk in the will of God, we will prove at the end that God's will is good, it is pleasing, and it has been a complete and perfect will for us. It's this conviction that God will cause all things to work together for good for those who love Him and who are called according to His purpose. So I hope this week you've really been chewing on the, these truths and letting them uh, seep deep into your heart. Those of you who have been followers of Christ for four decades and you spent the week trying to pass this on, or those who have just been exposed to Romans 12, 1 and 2. But we hope that you hear this. I appeal to you by the mercies of God Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, what is acceptable, and what is perfect. Amen. Just a few words of what's next. So you may have had a child this week who made a profession of faith through Vacation Bible School. And so you're wondering, well, what's the next step for that? Well, the next step for that is baptism. Baptism is the way that we publicly identify with Christ. It's the way we demonstrate before the church that we've become a new creation in Christ and we've committed to follow Christ as Lord and Savior. And so really the next step to that, if you've got a child that you think is, is ready for that, uh, come talk to me. That's the next step of that. So come find me at the celebration afterwards, bring your child to me, and we'll talk about that next step of baptism. You may have a child who's just starting to ask a lot of questions. Their, spiritual, their interest in spiritual things has really been to be heightened, and so they're asking a bunch of questions. Well, we want you to know that in the fall, usually in September or October, there's a special class during the children's Sunday school hour about a new Christian class. It's specifically designed for children to talk about salvation on their terms and on their level. So be paying attention to that when those details come out. We'd like to invite your, your child to go to that, that class. Hopefully you've had a good week of Vacation Bible School. I hope that you'll see at the, at the back page of your bulletin there all the age-appropriate activities that are coming up for kids. We invite you to be a part of that. Uh, some of those have registration, and you can do that through our church website as well. So uh, hopefully you're uh, aware of that as well. So as we come to our song of response this morning, what, what other song could we sing other than On Christ the Solid Rock I Stand? We've been spending the whole week talking about God's rock-solid truth in a world of shifting sands. This old hymn uh, simply says, On Christ the Solid Rock I Stand, All Other Ground is Sinking Sand. All other ground is sinking sand.